You're listening to Conferences on Line Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is April 29, 2011, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, latex allergy. Our presenter is Dr. Kevin Kelly. He's a professor and vice chair of pediatrics at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Welcome to Conferences on Line Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is April 29, 2011. Um, we're very fortunate to be joined this morning by our form, the former chairman of here, uh, Dr. Kevin Kelly. Uh, Dr. Kelly is now a professor uh, in the Department of Pediatrics and Allergy Immunology uh, in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It, uh, and that's um, it, at uh, Milwaukee Children's Hospital, right? Yeah. And um, Dr. Kelly uh, was one of the uh, people who actually uh, discovered the cause of latex allergy about 10 years ago. Uh, latex allergy, as you know, uh, was a significant problem for, for quite a while, and uh, it continues to be a problem, but it, it tends to be something that we're less familiar with now because I, I think that s some of the interventions that have taken place have been so effective. Sometimes if things are terribly effective, you, you start to forget that the problem is still there, but apparently it's that there is still a significant issue with latex allergy. So we're going to hear um, about latex allergy from one of the founding fathers. So welcome back to uh, Conferences on Line Allergy, uh, Kevin Kelly. Well, thanks, Jay, um, and I hope everybody can hear me. I'm on the telephone uh, with this, and so Jay is going to be controlling uh, my slides. Uh, next slide, Jay. You're loud and clear. Uh, as you can see, I have no relevant conflicts of interest for this CME program. Next. Uh, in your uh, CME credit, there's going to be three questions there. This is the first question, which we'll go over at the end of this. Uh, latex allergy was most prevalent before latex precautions were introduced. In which group? Uh, and you'll have to answer that at the end of uh, the session. Uh, next question. This is a patient-specific question. A patient presents 15 minutes after blowing up a latex balloon, develops lip swelling, hives, wheezing, and low blood pressure. The immunocap result shows anti-latex IgE antibodies less than 0 0.35 uh, units. And uh, uh, you're going to answer uh, whether this patient has latex allergy, doesn't have latex allergy, and uh, what should you do uh, to determine if that's true or not? Hmm. Next question. Uh, screening for latex allergies performed on 10,000 blood samples. 10% 10 of the tests were abnormal. Which of the following is true? I hope by the end of this, uh, this will maybe be a little bit clearer, but uh, I think it's still controversial. So, next, Jay. Uh, so, our educational objectives this morning are to review the chemistry of natural rubber latex, review the clinical history and findings of latex allergy, review the diagnostic dilemma that's presented by patients with possible latex allergy and review our therapeutic approaches for this. One of the fun things, it uh, um, looks like the fellows are uh, in the room, Jay, um, is that most of them have never seen a case of latex allergy, or if they have, they've only seen one or two. Um, straw poll, how many of you have seen a case of latex allergy? There, there you go. I've seen this. Based on history, testing with negative or based on history. History, positive history, negative test. Okay. So, so, but you have to understand that somewhere around 1993 to 1995, two to three patients every half day of clinic came in with latex allergy when we were seeing them, and with incredibly impressive stories and we uh, if this was a, a true epidemic that occurred in the 1990s and late 80s. So this is a uh, the tree Havia brasiliensis on the slide. Underneath the bark of the tree is a circulation system uh, where the uh, latex actually circulates uh, through the tree. Um, and there are about 2,000 lactifer plants in the world of which Havia brasiliensis is one of them. Good morning, Paul. Morning. Uh, nice to see you. Um, and uh, this is a worker in the field tapping a tree uh, and making a, a very thin cut. 
uh, to get the lay text to follow next slide. Uh, the uh, uh, latex is collected in buckets in the field uh, like this, and most of this uh, uh, medical grade latex is collected in Malaysia, Southeast Asia region uh, right now. As you can see, this is not a sterile procedure uh, at all. Next slide. Uh, the workers then uh, collect this, and this is a, a collecting station where uh, the uh, latex is actually poured into a uh, pipe, and you'll see a pipe that's going off on the right side of the slide there. Next slide, Jay. Uh, and eventually what happens is this latex is uh, carried in trucks and stored in large, large vats. During the 1980s, with the advent of universal precautions, the storage time of latex before it was used for products lasted probably up to six months. We think it went down to about two weeks during uh, the heyday of uh, increasing latex production um, and may have some contribution to, to what happened, but we're unclear of that. Next slide. Kind of a perfect storm then because suddenly there was an explosion of use of latex products at the time when the latex allergy started off. And to to use uh, latex in a medical grade uh, type of facility, these are uh, very large centrifuges in Malaysia. Uh, if you were to stand next to them, they would be um, as tall or taller than you. And, and this is the way to concentrate latex. It actually is just like cream of milk uh, that would rise to the surface. And so uh, this is a way to uh, actually uh, concentrate the latex. Uh, next slide. So let's go into latex and why do we need it. Uh, latex has always been the most effective barrier um, in the uh, medical field and in, in, in non-medical field uh, for uh, water uh, penetration to be uh, stopped, virus, bacteria, and blood uh, transmission to be stopped. It's very tear resistant. Um, it has extraordinarily good elasticity compared to synthetic products. And a term called modulus uh, is used. And that's the ability to do form latex, and it will return to its original shape. Next slide. Um, the, uh, what this is used for in manufacturing is to get um, polyisoprene, which is actually a polymer of acetyl-CoA. And uh, it is cis-1,4 uh, polyisoprene. And if you look at this, I call this, uh, for those of us who are in pediatrics, I call this the uh, uh, slinky, uh, for those of you who remember that toy, uh, it's just like that. It, it elongates and goes back into, into shape fairly effectively. Next slide, Jay. Uh, so this is the content. It's about 70% cis-1,4 polyisoprene, about 27% water. And there's about 2% protein in the uh, native product that's used. And inside of the the subunits of that uh, are there about 240 peptides that have been uh, identified or at least seen uh, in immunoblot. About 50 of them appear to be allergenic. And currently, and to this day, there's 13 uh, characterized allergens that are HEV-B1 through HEV-B13. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that today, except for the fellows in the room where there's often a comment on the board uh, about a couple of very specific allergens, which I'll cover later. And then the rest of this is there's a lot of organic and inorganic material uh, from uh, this. So next slide. Uh, in the world's use, uh, most rubber is used as dry coagulated rubber. Uh, and this is often heat vulcanized to very high temperatures, 600 degrees. Uh, it is uh, uh, maybe as long as uh, t multiple hours, 6, 24 hours. And this is tires and other such things. And the amount of um, protein that has not been destroyed by that heat vulcanization process is relatively minimal. And to our patients, who often have anxiety about seeing these products, uh, these are not uh, of high concern to them and, and very few reports of problems with them in people who are latex allergic. 
Next so slide. like the rubber tire particles on playgrounds and stuff like that are not really a problem, are they? Yeah, they have not been a problem, Jay, to my knowledge, except for some probably some very select uh, canaries in the mine, maybe, and that's about it. So um, next slide. This is uh, the rubber that uh, seems to be most problematic uh, for uh, uh, human disease. Uh, this is uh, uh, a porcelain model of the making of a glove. And as you can see, there's a slurry of latex. Uh, a coagulant is put on the surface of these uh, porcelain hands. They're dipped into this uh, um, latex uh, vat. And then they are, it sticks to there, and it's heat vulcanized again. But it's heat vulcanized for a very short time at a fairly low temperature, usually uh, 140 to 180 degrees or so. Um, and uh, it, it depends upon who the manufacturer is and what you're trying to make with it. Uh, but that heat vulcanization process is not effective at destroying the protein in those gloves. And that protein. Uh, once these gloves are dried out and other dipped products are dried out, easily leach out of this uh, onto the um, skin or into the air if uh, a powder is placed on there that's a good carrier, which became part of the problem in, with this epidemic. Next slide. So uh, important thing uh, for the clinician is um, it's really the dipped rubber products that cause the most reactions, and to remember that. And uh, I guess I, I anticipated my slide, Jay, so this is uh, really uh, that. So we'll go on to the next one. Uh, if you uh, look at that, I've already told you there's multiple uh, significant allergens that are in there. There are numerous clinical cross-reactions that occur with these allergens. So, and uh, there are also non-clinical immune uh, cross-reactions uh, as well. And uh, which interferes with some of the testing, possibly, that's going on uh, in individuals. And why is this? Most of the proteins that are in latex are there for a very specific reason. They're there to defend the tree from getting uh, ill. Uh, it fights off mold. It fights off uh, other uh, um, invading bacteria. And so all of these. Uh, endochitinases, enzymes, lipid transfer proteins, which we know are common allergens and are typical for cross-reactions with fruits and vegetables, um, are really uh, uh, the cause of why people have problems with uh, the clinical cross-reactivity and the non-clinical but immune cross-reactivity in the test tube. Next slide. Uh, this is a, a immunoblot. All this is to show you. Uh, or I'm sorry, it's an SDS polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. Just to show you, there's all those little spots represent different proteins uh, with uh, uh, different sizes and um, isoelectric focus. And that's where we found 240 of these peptides. Next slide. If you map those proteins, um, which uh, this is something we published in the 1990s, uh, you'll see that some of those proteins are very specific. So the circles that have no uh, coloring inside of them were proteins that only patients with spina bifida reacted to uh, who had latex allergy. Uh, and the cross hatches were individuals who um, were healthcare workers and reacted only to those proteins. And then there are some common proteins that react uh, in both of those groups. Those two groups were the most prevalent groups with disease um, in the 1990s. Um, and so they were easy to study to uh, do the comparisons. Uh, next slide. So this is where the fellows' questions come up on the boards. I uh, see you picking up your pens. Um, and uh, good job. Uh, so uh, interestingly, HEV-B1 and HEV-B3 are actually membrane-bound uh, proteins uh, that uh, are still retained in the finished product. turns out that patients with spina bifida are extraordinarily sen sensitive to getting or getting sensitized to those two proteins. And they're a rubber elongation factors, so there are actually enzymes involved in the making of the uh, elongated polyisoprene. Uh, the rest of the proteins are mostly water soluble. Um, and uh, it turns out that HEV-B6, which is Hevean, uh, and has common cross-reactivities with many of the uh, 
uh, different proteins and fruits um, is the major constituent of uh, a protein that's left over in latex. Uh, and many of the healthcare workers and other people, as well as spina bifida, are sensitized to that protein when, you're, when you have disease. Latex was an interesting problem because it also uh, presented in people who had dermatitis. And for a long time in the medical literature, uh, there was uh, talk about uh, individuals who had contact dermatitis preceding the development of latex allergy. Uh, I think we know enough now to suggest that, at least in healthcare workers, um, a large percentage of them who get latex allergy have irritant dermatitis. And irritant dermatitis, uh, you should recognize, um, it is uh, usually a red erythematous. It's not weeping. There's no uh, vesiculation. And uh, it stops uh, where the irritant would stop, which would be at the edge of the glove if it, in, in this case. Uh, next slide. Contact dermatitis does have vesiculation. It has weeping. Um, it's very itchy, uh, very angry at times. And most of the chemicals that cause this are retained chemicals that are used in the vulcanization process of latex. And they're thiorams and mercaptobenzothiazole. Uh, the thiorams are usually in gloves. Mercaptobenzothiazole, we find uh, individuals who get contact dermatitis with their tennis shoes and other rubber products that are in their shoes uh, seem to be more common. There was one report in the 1990s about latex proteins baby being able to induce uh, contact dermatitis. I, I've never seen that replicated, and so I'm really not clear that it uh, happens or not. Uh, but in healthcare workers, you will see this uh, preceding dermatitis of some kind uh, concurrent with or preceding their latex allergy. Not the case in spina bifida. Very few of them uh, have latex allergy uh, with a dermatitis preceding it. Uh, next slide. So this is what we're talking about, though. This is an uh, latex allergy is an IgE-mediated um, disease, um, and uh, the allergens are proteins, um, and uh, there are multiple risk factors. There may be some genetics involved with this. Um, Carlos Blanco um, has looked at the HLA antigen uh, work around this uh, when he was in the Canary Islands, and. Uh, there may be some specific groups uh, that are sensitized uh, or more predisposed to getting sensitive to latex. Uh, we're worried about that with the patients with spina bifida, especially those, as you know, there's a gene uh, malformation in the VANG1, I think it's called, uh, uh, gene that uh, predisposes those individuals who are not getting spina bifida because they're folate deficient uh, in, during the intake of, of moms. Uh, that uh, predispose them, and, but that has not been completely followed up at this time. Next slide. So uh, just to highlight uh, what happened is the very first case report and the constellation of symptoms and signs of latex allergy were identified in the, basically in the 1980s. Uh, the next decade was spent on identification and prevention strategies and prevalence studies. And quite honestly, in the last decade, uh, very little new information um, has uh, been uh, produced. Uh, I'm happy to report that you will be able to read in uh, the Journal of Occupational and Environmental Medicine, um, I think this year, um, uh, some very new information uh, with this. And I'm, I'm not, I presented uh, the preliminaries around this the last lecture I gave on conferences online. Uh, but uh, I'm going to hold off on that until it's published uh, for you. Uh, but I do think that we've uh, gotten to the point where the speculation that latex gloves caused this epidemic uh, by association, I, I think we have some uh, evidence that uh, helps support that even in a firmer manner. Uh, next slide. So what happened? Uh, most of the people in the room, uh, Paul and Jay and, and Brock and, and I know about the uh, advent of universal or standard precautions. Most of uh, the fellows in the room, that's just been part of your life, uh, but did not exist uh, before 1987. Uh, it resulted in a marked increase in exposure to latex gloves in the healthcare worker population. 
Um, and it was specifically, and this was missed for a long time, was specifically examination gloves. And examination gloves had a very high allergen content uh, in the finished product. And although there's 40,000 or more latex products, I, uh, other, imp, you know, other products like infant pacifiers, household gloves, we're not completely sure of their contribution uh, to the epidemic, but some people think that there was a mild contribution from some of those. Christine Terjanma in Finland believes that household gloves probably accounted for a third of the latex allergy in Finland as opposed to healthcare worker gloves. Um, and then uh, the other causes were those people who were sensitized to those proteins that we noted before that are common in fruits. And we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, next slide. Uh, it's very clear that if you're atopic, you're much more predisposed to getting latex allergy. Um, and uh, you probably only need a, a very small quantity to get sensitized. And somewhere in the advent of increasing number of gloves, possibly increased amount of allergen in those gloves and other sources, uh, was enough to create an epidemic uh, in the 1990s of latex allergy. Uh, and uh, we also, I hope, will be able to show um, in our paper uh, to be published that, in fact, um, this was responsible for sensitization and that this wasn't pre-existing sensitization. This, is, this has been a problem uh, in some of the studies that have been out there of, of trying to really prove because they haven't followed the same patient group. And so they haven't, most of the studies, if you look at them closely, they haven't taken the same patient who didn't have latex allergy, see if they get exposed or show them the exposure, have them get latex sensitized, remove that exposure and see what happens uh, to them. Uh, over time with the same uh, sequential uh, analysis of the same patients. Um, next slide, Jay. This is what happened. Um, Jay, if you can move your uh, the mouse or the pointer over, you'll see that uh, in 1980, the number of latex examination gloves used in the United States was about 300 million. If we go all the way to 2008, uh, we've exceeded 30 billion gloves, uh, which uh, is a very significant uh, amount. This is over a hundredfold increase in uh, the amount of gloves uh, used. And you'll see that surgeon's gloves and sterile gloves, uh, they're negligible increase uh, over that same period of time. So that most of us just from a, you know, it's uh, do you have to do a randomized controlled trial of uh, not wearing a parachute jumping out of a plane to know that it's not good for you? Um, I, I don't think we have to do that. Um, I think there's some intuition here that suggests that this was associated. Um, next slide. So. Uh, one of the questions, though, that came was um, if there were pre-sensitized individuals, did we just expose their sensitization because by raising the allergen exposure, they became symptomatic? And this was a question that I don't know that has been ever completely answered, but we, we think our study will uh, answer this uh, here when it's published. Next slide, Jay. Uh, this is just historical background for you. Uh, in fact, uh, you can find uh, an urticarial response to rubber in the medical literature in 1927, uh, but uh, in, that's in a German uh, journal uh, back then. And then you, in 1979, in the British Journal of Dermatology, Dr. Nutter uh, presents an a individual uh, who uh, develops urticaria with exposure um, uh, to rubber uh, products. After that, there is a whole number of um, adverse events reported to FDA that was sort of the beginning of the epidemic. Uh, next slide. In 1980, then, uh, Forstrom uh, gave uh, notice to us that, in fact, allergic rhinitis was being caused in an occupational uh, 
setting uh, with this and started to give us a clue because you, obviously you could transfer this from your hand to your nose, but that this may be airborne. And uh, Christina uh, Terjanma in Finland uh, was the first to really start to identify that healthcare workers were the at-risk population at, at that time and identified in a published study anaphylaxis. And so we're starting to see respiratory, we're seeing anaphylaxis, and we're seeing urticaria. Next slide. Uh, Sweden, uh, Dr. Axelson uh, reported anaphylaxis in a non-healthcare worker for the first time in 87. Um, and it was that same year that Christina published the prevalence of 3% of latex sensitization in healthcare workers in the operating room compared to uh, controls of about 1%. And Seton uh, then is the first person to identify occupational asthma uh, as a contribution. Next slide. Uh, the cross-reactivity between uh, foods is uh, Dr. Brayler in Germany. As you can see, this is a European disease uh, in terms of the investigators looking at this to begin with. Uh, very little coming out of the US at this time. But he identifies cross-reactivity between fig and latex as the first hint that there was going to be this uh, latex fruit uh, syndrome. And uh, Lenadier uh, in France also starts to identify this in 1989. And following that, uh, numerous people, and, and probably the most, uh, most prominent people have been the Japanese interested in this. And um, uh, this was Carlos Blanco in the, in the Canary Islands um, at that time, looking at multiple cross -reactions. And I'll, I'll bring this, we'll go forward with that, Jay. Uh, and uh, then the spina bifida thing came to light uh, in 1989. Uh, with two separate case reports, uh, Jay Slater in the New England Journal of Medicine and Dr. Gerber in Switzerland uh, with patients having anaphylaxis uh, uh, who had spina bifida to latex. And uh, there was clearly anaphylaxis before that, but the association had not been made. Next slide. Go ahead, Jay. Um, this is where um, I was. Uh, able to get involved and, uh, with this. And it turns out that um, uh, at Children's Hospital of Wisconsin in 1990, uh, we identified in July um, a uh, couple of episodes of anaphylaxis in the operating room. And uh, it turned out that uh, one day we had two of them on the same day. Now most of you in the room don't know that I'm a critical care physician as well as an allergist immunologist. And it was 1990 when I decided to leave critical care and go back into allergy. And it was my anesthesia colleagues who said, now that you're going to be doing allergy, do you want to see these kids with anaphylaxis in the operating room? I said, sure. Um, and uh, the first one was on July 3rd. The one was like three weeks later. And then like somewhere around August 5th or 6th, two patients having CPR at the same time in the operating room, both with spina bifida. And I said, gee, this is highly unusual. Um, called my friends uh, I, uh, at the state uh, health and board, and they called CDC, and they came in. We actually identified 11 severe episodes of anaphylaxis in 10 spina bifida patients over a one-year period of time. And we had a control group we looked at. This was a 500-fold increase in the rate of anaphylaxis in this group. And uh, this was enough to stop all elective surgery on patients with spina bifida in the US in 1991. And, uh, because we didn't know it was latex allergy. Eventually, they all went on to be tested. 100% of them had latex allergy. And uh, removal of latex from their environment made it safe for them. Uh, a survey was done by CDC after that. And the same phenomenon was ongoing in, in the 100 children's uh, centers and hospitals that they identified. Uh, next slide. Um, as I said, they were all uh, latex positive. And I'm going to show you the Buretrol system that we linked this to. It was not linked to gloves um, in this case. Um, and it was uh, linked to probably intravenous uh, injection of latex allergen. Next slide. 
as we know, those injector ports were always on uh, IV tubing. And uh, next slide, Jay. It turns out that this was a unique puritrol system that our anesthesiologists had put into our operating room uh, because uh, they uh, were a level one trauma center at the children's hospital. And they would have these pre-filled the night before. And they didn't want air getting down into the line. So they have check valves in them. Those two check valves are little cookie cutters of latex. And these would sit. And uh, overnight, uh, they get them prepared for the uh, um, trauma cases that might come in. And then they were all became the IV solution for the first cases of the day in the operating room. Uh, and uh, these patients all had anaphylaxis basically within 15 minutes of the induction of anesthesia. And no surgeon ever got their knife onto uh, the patient. So simultaneously, Milt Gold up in Canada reported um, anesthesia-related events to gloves in the intraperitoneal cavity. And those happened later. So they happened about 180 to 220 minutes into uh, the operating room uh, suite uh, work, while well, these all happened within 15 to 30 minutes or, or so. so. They were two different mechanisms of causing anaphylaxis, uh, mucosal surface contact and probably injection. Next slide. So, so I assume that the process used to sterilize these things was not sufficient to uh, denature the latex allergens? Yeah, we think not, Jay. And so those, you know, those, those injector ports that were on there are probably hardened rubber. Um, and they, they probably did not contribute to this at all. Another phenomenon actually occurred then, and that was the event of barium enemas um, causing anaphylaxis. If you go back through the 1980s, there are a number of deaths associated with uh, air contrast barium enemas that were performed uh, in those days. And it was Denny uh, Owenby who identified that it was the, actually the balloon on the catheter coming in contact with the rectal mucosa that caused um, the anaphylaxis in these patients. After that, it's pretty much of a free-for-all of all of um, numerous authors around the world talking about um, healthcare workers at risk of reactions to latex gloves. And uh, Susan Tarlow uh, studying uh, occupational asthma in a glove manufacturing plant showing um, that uh, association uh, as well. Next slide. So what are the clinical manifestations? I think we've been through them all. These are the typical IgE-mediated reactions. Um, and uh, importantly, what was very difficult in the 1990s and probably the first half of, of the 2000 uh, decade uh, was the advent of, of occupational asthma and trying to eliminate uh, that particular problem for healthcare workers. Uh, next slide. Uh, who then became at risk? It was really spina bifida, healthcare workers, individuals who were highly exposed, atopic individuals, and then another report um, out of Philadelphia suggesting individuals with multiple surgeries are at risk. And with increasing number of surgeries, a otherwise non-risk factor person could get uh, sensitized uh, to latex. The other uh, individuals we found neonates were getting sensitized who had prolonged stays in the neonatal units and individuals who had tracheostomies and had prolonged mechanical ventilation uh, may have been. The reason the general population question came up is because we've had insufficient um, testing capacity uh, for um, latex allergy. And one has to be very careful of identifying what the prevalence is when you do a serologic assay versus what you do when you do skin testing. There's two large skin test studies done in Europe suggesting in the 1980s suggesting that the general population prevalence of latex allergy is 1%. And uh, there are numerous healthcare worker studies suggesting that the prevalence is somewhere between uh, 6% to as high as 17% uh, in very, they were very selected populations. Um, and, but a lot of those were done with serologic assays, and we're going to talk about those in a while. And Brock, are you still on the line? Brock can probably... Uh, uh, yeah, Brock, are you on the line? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I, I'm just, Brock will probably be able to tell you a little more about these assays in terms of uh, that's some of the value of the COLA program is the interaction we get here. So let's go to the next slide, Jay. 
so uh, we've gone over most of this. Um, and the important part of the 1990s was we learned how to take care of patients uh, with latex allergy safely in the hospital. And uh, we went through all of those uh, dipped products and then the non-dipped products. We went crazy trying to take all of them out of the hospitals. And, and there's signs all over hospitals about latex precautions and things. And I think what we learned was that uh, we needed to use powder-free uh, gloves. We didn't even have to specify that they were or were not latex in retrospect, because once you get the powder off of them, there's very little airborne um, allergen. Um, and uh, you know, the individuals who are latex allergic, they obviously can't touch those products, and that that is an issue. But we lost a lot of healthcare workers to disability uh, during uh, this time, while we still were able to take care of them safely. And we went through, and there will be issues around the first case of the day, possibly on board, and questions, is this a good way to handle patients? It was a good way to handle patients because the work out of Mayo Clinic and, and out of Germany suggested that latex allergen uh, it binds to cornstarch powder. It goes into the air, but then it falls rapidly out of the air uh, to the ground, so it doesn't stay airborne. Um, so if you don't introduce a new disturbance, um, with gloves that are powdered, you could safely take care of those individuals as the first case of the day in the operating room. Um, if you had a patient with latex allergy where powdered latex gloves were used um, and throughout the day, that was not a safe environment for them to have their operation in. And there are numerous uh, uh, anecdotes about uh, significant uh, reactions of wheeling people into operating room suites. Next slide. Uh, the other interesting part of this, uh, and is part of the problem with the reagents that we have on the market, is Soily, uh, Mackin, and Kilunin um, in Finland uh, dealt, identified a whole bunch of new antigens that are created by the heat vulcanization process. And so when we test, and we tested with the Clone 600 um, uh, uh, in the uh, 1990s multi-center skin test and serologic testing. It turns out we don't we don't have um, all the relevant allergens um, in that testing material. Uh, so uh, next slide. Let's talk quickly about the latex fruit syndrome, and this is always board choice. Um, next slide, Jay. It turns out that um, studies from Carlos and Blanco and others suggest that 50% of patients with symptomatic latex allergy have clinical reactions to foods. So I just repeat that. So that if you have latex allergy, one out of every two of them will have symptom with some food. Uh, and most of those symptoms have been with banana, kiwi, avocado, um, uh, fruits. The opposite, so this is that logic questions you used to take in college, 10% of patients with food allergies that are would be the cross-reacting foods to latex, about 10% of them get symptoms when they contact latex from a separate study. Hmm. Those haven't been replicated uh, very much, and uh, so that's the best data we have. My guess is that um, the 50% may be slightly less, and the 10% may be slightly less as well as we've learned more about this. But that's the best that we can do from the medical literature, I think. Next slide. So what I've done with the next three slides is I've tried to divide them up into foods that cause clinical cross-reactivity um, and foods that um, where the uh, there's immunologic cross-reactivity, but little clinical activity. So this is the first slide, and these are probably the most important foods to cause clinical cross-reactivity. Put potato on there. Um, it's probably raw potato as opposed to cooked potato, just so you know. Um, next slide. Uh, these are the foods that have been implicated where if you have primary food allergy to banana, melon, or peach, that you get cross-reactions to latex. Next slide. 
And these are the foods where there's a lot of immunologic cross-reactivity been identified. There are a few clinical reports of, of symptoms around these individuals, but in general, uh, there's more immunologic cross-reactivity than there is clinical cross-reactivity in terms of symptoms. Uh, next slide. This is work from Timo uh, Pelusua, um, and this is Havain, which was HEV-B6. And these, this is a 32 kilodalton banana protein. And it, this is the 3D structure that has been modeled. And as you can see, although they are completely separate amino acid sequences, their structure is incredibly similar uh, to each other. Um, and we believe that a significant amount of the cross-reactivity that occurs clinically is due to this 32 kilodalton banana protein that is homology uh, to Havain um, and has a very, very similar tertiary uh, structure uh, to the Havain protein. So and remember, Havain was 50% of the protein content of the finished rubber product. Next slide. So the amino acid sequence is not the same, but the structure is? Yes. Oh. <clears throat> and I'll go into the powder a little bit. Uh, that slide followed by the next slide. Okay. I used to have a pop that I could do with an uh, uh, insert with this. But uh, many of you are not used to seeing uh, powdered latex gloves in healthcare situations any longer. Um, or, uh, but you'll see them in the you'll see them in the Home Depot or the Lowe's for the painters and the other people who want to use them because that's a lot of where they've gone to, uh, unfortunately. Um, and it turns out the cornstarch is uh, highly polymerized glucose is all that it is. Uh, so it doesn't uh, it, it it acts as a carrier. It doesn't really bind, if you will, uh, the latex protein. But it carried it into the air and allowed you to inhale it. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, courtesy of Henning Almers from Germany uh, to me. And uh, he's allowed me to publish this after he published it um, in a chapter and, and, and use this. So I, my hat's off to Henning. Because they do challenges that I would never do. And I'm going to show you one. Next slide, Jay. This is an individual uh, healthcare worker. A young lady, uh, you see her flow volume loop uh, on there. Next slide. She had a glove snapped in her face uh, with powder on it. Next slide. And this is her 15 minutes later, and this is her uh, flow volume loop uh, with an impressive obstructive uh, component uh, to this with conjunctivitis and rhinitis. Uh, there's no doubt that this patient is allergic to latex. Um, That's what my allergic that. patients look like right now. Um, so welcome to yes. This is this was the tree pollen of the operating room. Yes. Uh, so next slide. Uh, Banden Plus uh, looked at uh, um, occupational asthma then across a large group of nurses um, and uh, out of Portugal, and turns out that the individual latex allergy there were 13 of them. Twelve of them had rhinitis symptoms. Half of them, when they contacted gloves, got asthma symptoms. But they actually did a bronchial hyperresponsiveness testing. And uh, with, um, I think in this case it was histamine. Uh, and 12 of the 12 had bronchial hyperresponsiveness, although they hadn't identified themselves as having asthma. One smart person declined testing. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide. Uh, this is a, another article from Brugnami uh, looking at occupational asthma and looking at outcomes of occupational asthma of six individuals with occupational uh, induced um, uh, symptoms uh, from glove challenge. Um, and, uh, and it turns out that uh, this is the uh, same stuff of Moira Chang Young up in, uh, in with uh, cedar, uh, western red cedar. Uh, sensitivity uh, that about half of the people who got sensitized and got asthma, when you remove the primary source of the allergen um, in them, they continue to have asthma afterwards. Now, the problem is we don't test these people. Do, did they have asthma beforehand um, or not? But it looks like uh, for it's a typical occupational asthma disease. Next slide. So the question is, is latex allergy gone? The fellows have never seen latex allergy. Um, and next slide. 
And certainly by publication, um, and I haven't completed this, you, you could just follow the bell-shaped curve. The number of publications about latex allergy has continued to decline. Next slide. And multiple prevalence studies uh, since the mid-1990s with the advent of powder-free low, low allergen latex gloves have shown that, in fact, the prevalence of this is declining. And NATO showed that the prevalence in spina bifida, which was as high as 68% in the studies that we did up here, um, has declined dramatically with latex-safe precautions. Uh, next slide. Uh, Henning uh, in uh, Germany, they have a national policy um, that they've uh, that is law to ban powdered gloves, and you will see. And they also by uh, by law have to report occupational asthma, <coughs> and you can see the decline over time. He's published this in Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. This is a, a follow-up slide uh, two years later after that publication uh, from him. Next slide. So the question rises, can you actually prevent this by changing the gloves? Because we know that the prevalence has changed, but is that cause and effect? turns out there's been three longitudinal incident studies, and um, the one that I cited at the beginning of this talk will be the fourth. Uh, and they really were inconclusive about cause and effect relationship between latex gloves and sensitization. And you know, I, I mentioned about the parachute study. We we don't do a randomized control of jumping out of airplanes without parachutes, um, and we think there was enough evidence uh, to suggest that the cause of sensitization was from latex gloves, but we still want to prove it if we if we can. Um, so, next slide. Uh, there are three reasons we think for reduced prevalence that could be the case. There's less sensitization, there's loss of sensitization, or what's the healthy survivor effect? What's a healthy survivor? A healthy survivor is, um, if, let's say if you work in a, in a, I'm making this up, this doesn't occur, um, or the names have been protected if it does. Uh, in, uh, in Malaysia, for example, if you work in the, uh, uh, fields and collect latex, they apparently don't see latex allergy. Now, they're either desensitized or maybe the workers left work and don't work there any longer. It turns out that in the study that uh, we worked on, we, we published as an abstract, you're three times more likely to leave healthcare if you get latex allergy than if you don't have latex allergy. And so it's possible that the only people that are left in healthcare are those people who are never going to get allergic to latex. Next slide. Content of allergen gloves actually declined over a hundredfold in the 1990s when this was made known to the manufacturers and probably through litigation. Uh, uh, this slide, um, in terms of manufacturing, still 50% or so of the gloves in the U.S. Um, are now powder free. Um, we're, we're actually getting to the point where uh, the manufacturers themselves are going to stop making them, though, because uh, they know the risk associated with this. Uh, next slide. So I'm worried. I don't know whether it will be true. Uh, but if we've increased the use of gloves by 100-fold, but we only decreased the allergen content by 100-fold, if we cross this threshold of all these gloves being used again, will we see another epidemic? For the individual, maybe not, because they can only use so many gloves a day. And if they're not powdered, they're not inhaling them. But um, I want to continue to give these lectures a little bit to um, those people who've never seen this, because this may reemerge, and you may be the person to identify that it start to reemerge. Next slide. What about latex safe health facilities? Uh, next slide. Uh, what are we telling people? No skin or mucous membrane contact with latex material for a latex allergic patient. No powdered latex gloves in the operating room or the hospital for that matter. Medication biotops. There's a rare risk of a problem, but we have multiple cases of um, sensitization to latex uh, in diabetics at this point in time. 
and there have been reactions reported with vaccines. Uh, if you go onto the CDC website, they now have all the vaccines listed of whether they have latex in the vial top or in their syringe. Um, we usually, uh, if patients in the hospital with latex allergy, you put a warning on their room and a patient ban so that people don't do this. And many people have uh, put in uh, restrictive diets to take those foods, those multiple, those couple of foods that are commonly uh, causing clinical reactions in latex allergic patients like uh, kiwi and banana and taking them off of the trays of the patients in the hospital. And that first case of the day thing we mentioned before. Next slide. Uh, this is a slide that predates our knowledge of that hard coagulated rubber um, is not a huge problem. And uh, it was an idea to let you know where all the rubber is uh, from that point of view and how difficult that would be to get rid of. Next slide. Um, we do want people who need uh, protection uh, to use appropriate latex gloves because uh, it still is one of the best barriers out there. Uh, but if you don't need them, you know, and, and you go to food lines and other kinds of things where you're not worrying about virus disease being transmitted from the food uh, to you, uh, it's better to use a non-latex glove um, in that situation. Next slide. Next slide. So. We still have not established that the general population has really been sensitized to this or that it preexisted. And these are all the blood studies that were done on, uh, by Dennis Ollenby, uh, Andy Saxon, and Grzbowski works with uh, Dennis Ollenby, looking at randomized serologic assays uh, with the commercially available assays on the market. And this is where I want Brock to comment with us. It, it has been uh, suggested that maybe all these people are sensitized, and especially with Dennis's last study with the 8.2 percent uh, serology, uh, with the first author being Grzbowski. Um, but uh, we're we're concerned that most of these in a low prevalence population are actually false positive reactions even though you can reduplicate that in the patient, maybe due to these cross-reactions that are in the serum uh, from this. Uh, but we're not seeing clinical latex allergies, so we don't know what this means. Uh, you want Brock to comment on that? Yeah. Go ahead, Brock. Yeah, yeah uh, I think, I think it's, uh, it, they're not false positive. Uh, they might be false positive clinically, but as far as the test goes, they're certainly uh, true positives. Uh, the problem is now that we know about components and that in latex probably uh, I think at least 10 of the 14 different allergens are essentially common with foods. And so a lot of the positivity that we saw, sensitized but maybe not sensitive, it is due to these, uh, uh, these IgE to these foods. And we just didn't sort all that out in the beginning and so it confused us. And maybe I should have said it better uh, for the fellows and, and people listening is that these aren't necessarily a falsely positive test. What they are is they're not identifying clinical disease. Uh, and just as a skin test to a food allergen doesn't necessarily um, uh, denote that you're going to have a clinical reaction to that food. Um, well, the so. difference is that with a food allergen, you ingest the food and it digests. You break it down, and so things that are sense that are labile tend to get broken down and not cause clinical symptoms. When you're exposed to latex, though, you're exposed by a different route, cutaneous yeah. or respiratory, and it's not by ingestion, so it's different. Uh, next slide, Jim. No, but it's, it's just dealing with sensitization, not sensitivity. You know, yeah, like that's talking right. about sensitization. So. Um, these are all the reasons behind which we just talked about. Um, uh, I, 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 as, I, as Brock said, false positive, I think it's unlikely, but positive, I, I mean, the reactions are, 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 are mostly cross-reactions, most likely. And we all, all know now also that there are multiple pollens uh, that have cross-reactivity with latex. 
as well. And so there's so many people with pollen allergy that there still may be cross-reactivity there as well. Next slide. This, uh, we're almost at the end, and uh, I uh, wanted to talk about diagnoses. Um, and uh, I knew I would probably run over Jay because of this. So let me, uh, why don't we go quickly through this um, okay. to the next slide. Uh, you can uh, take a history uh, to determine latex allergy, and that gives you about a 15% false positive rate. Next slide. You can skin test, uh, and you may have sensitive patients, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're clinically allergic. Next slide. Or you can do serologic assays. This is the Clone uh, 600 multicenter skin test study, suggesting that skin test is 100% sensitive, 95% specific, never was um, released or cleared by FDA, um, and uh, probably due to delayed and systemic reaction rates, as you can see, are, are fairly um, significant, although not life-threatening um, in these cases. Next slide. Uh, early skin testing. Uh, is problem uh, we were the very some of the very first to do skin testing here in the U.S. and uh, caused ended up with multiple anaphylactic reactions uh, from an unstandardized reagent, um, and uh, so it just hasn't been cleared. Uh, next slide. Uh, you can test for the serum, and that's what we were doing with the immunocaps and such thing. Next slide. Uh, so there's three FDA cleared tests right now that you deal with. Uh, next, immunocap, allostat, and high tech. Next slide. The sensitivity and specificity were assessed in the 1990s in a population that had a 40% prevalence of latex allergy. This was the multicenter test. Uh, next slide. False negatives around 27% sensitivity, 76% except for the high tech, which has a higher sensitivity, but a uh, higher false positive rate. Uh, next slide. Uh, I don't know that we can use these to predict the value uh, or in a because of the high prevalence of the population. So what we did um, as part of our s testing, um, this is a separate part that we're working on a paper right now. Next um, slide. Uh, We've used ELISA here, uh, which was an in-house ELISA, and we compared it with Clone 600. And during our uh, healthcare worker study that we did, um, this was performed also with Clone 600 and compared to ImmunoCap. Next slide. We presented this at the Academy uh, meeting. Uh, next slide, Jay. Just keep hitting the slides. So Deb said is one of my fellows, and uh, she presented this um, in San Francisco. Next slide. Um, and next slide. It's 805 healthcare workers. Uh, we had paired skin tests. So we used the Clone 600 skin test under IND. So these people were tested in duplicate with skin test to Clone 600. And uh, they had ImmunoCap and ELISA done. Next slide. Uh, and we developed receiver operator curves for the um, uh, immunocap and the ELISAs, and we also use different sources for latex for the immunocap. We bound our own uh, allergen to the matrix. Next slide. Uh, for those of you who don't know much about receiver operator curves, 11, the yellow one is a uh, excellent curve, a, the blue one is a uh, worthless curve, and the good one would be there. Next slide. Uh, so we had 792, we had 40 test positive. And so the prevalence in this group was 5%. Next slide. Turns out that in, if you use skin test as your gold standard in an unselected population, the sensitivity of these tests is not between 70 and 90%. It's only about 35%. If, and, uh, but the negative predictive value is actually pretty good and its specificity is pretty good. If you want to get to a specificity of 99%, you have to use a cutoff of 0.64 um, um, K units um, for uh, your test. Next slide, Jay. 
Uh, these are the RLC curves, and you can just click through these. There's about five of them, Jay. It just plots the different uh, ways that we did this. Uh, but in general, the tests that are out on the market are really lousy. Uh, and uh, it, with a sensitivity of 30 percent, um, but they're great. Um, they're great for um, negative predictive values um, uh, for this next slide. And but if you have an immunocap greater than 0.35, your odds ratio for the presence of latex sensitization is actually quite high. Uh, and if you use a glove, it's also quite high. Next slide. And if you use 0.64, your odds ratio goes up to 62. Uh, for this, so it, it, that turn, if you have a positive test, and this sort of flies in the face of our screening uh, study uh, of what to do with this. Next slide. So next, keep going. What's all this mean? The last thing it means, uh, basically, um, is that we have a very low capacity to detect, late, detect latex sensitization. Next slide. And a positive immunocap is actually pretty strong. It turns out that if we use our ELISA with this, um, you actually even get a better ROC curve. Um, and then hit the last one, Jay, there, please. My conclusions are we really need a new skin test reagent. Um, and I'm going to skip over this because I'm over time. So I'll stop, Jay. Um, and uh, if there's questions or comments, I'll get offline so you guys can do your next uh, lecture. Wow, that was great. Thank you, Kevin. Brock, did you want to to say something? Go ahead, Brock. Yeah. Oh, there you go. I, I muted yeah. myself. Muted now, yourself. Uh, one of the problems, did you compare how well the in vitro test worked uh, as, and using it as a standard, what would happen to the skin test? Yeah, yeah we're going to do that, Brock, uh, yeah. because um, the question is, are there multiple false positive skin tests? Right. And more importantly, we have all of the clinical symptomatology. And yeah. these patients have had duplicate skin testing over four years, uh, every year, and a survey done of their clinical symptoms. Yeah, so, another, another problem with skin testing is that we now know that a lot of the relevant allergens to anaphylaxis, uh, like the lipid transfer proteins, are very poorly represented in aqueous extracts. They're just mm -hmm. not that soluble, so so that's that's another little problem. But I I kind of wanted to go back to an old old point that we uh, uh, the history of this that we always argued about the powder. Yeah. And and I I still don't think it was the powder. I think it was the washing. Uh, I mean, your results show that getting rid of the powder. But what they did when they got rid of the powder was they washed the gloves, and thus removing most of the water soluble proteins. And so, it's, you know, that, uh, and probably the last yeah. point is that if you get all the allergen off of there and then you put powder back on there, which nobody will do now, yeah, we may not see occupational asthma because there's no allergen for the powder to bind. Right. It, it you know, did, I, I snapped gloves in a closet at a, IBT and measured the, uh, the rate of sedimentation of the powder and then also the rate of sedimentation of the allergen. And they were very different. Uh, the powder kind of hit the hit the ground pretty fast, and the, and and the, the uh, allergen stayed in the air for a while. So I was that's the clinical it experience like of too, Brock. And this is why some people are suggesting that all latex gloves, powdered or unpowdered, ought to be out of the hospital because there may be some release of allergen. And that's my concern about this threshold of, of things. So yeah, so if they wash them, then they're okay. <laughs> I guess. So. Yeah. Uh, any questions or anything? It, it's really great to see everybody, Jay and Paul. Thank you for inviting me back uh, to do this. Did you want to answer uh, questions? You got questions? Well, do you have the three questions? Oh, so uh, let's go to the next one. So, uh, it's the most so the answer to this is in the next slide. Okay. So it's probably healthcare workers and spina bifida would have been the would have been an okay answer to either of those. Next one. Okay. This is the patient who clinically clearly has an allergic reaction, um, and uh, this is one of the patients who probably has a false positive test. The key distractor here, you see, I grade this out uh, for those taking boards, is a non-standardized latex extract. I, I, I think uh, people are out there doing it, but I don't think we're recommending it. Next slide. Okay. 
Uh, and what's what's the answer here? Uh, we don't know. Uh, we think maybe the majority are false positive tests relative to clinical disease, uh, but uh, it's, we don't know whether we have to create a latex safe environment for those individuals. So thank you very much. And uh, great, great to hear from you again, you. Kevin. Okay, take, I'm take care of yourself and stay in touch. Okay. I will. All right. I'm hanging up. Take care. All right, we're going to take a break, and we'll be back in about three or four minutes, and uh, we'll have Jeopardy board here. Okay. The conference is online allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City. <laughs> This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time. <laughs>